my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Aeroflow has helped millions of new and expecting parents discover the breastfeeding and postpartum essentials covered by their insurance, including breast pumps, maternity compression, and lactation education and support. They take care of everything, including all paperwork, working with your insurance company, and explaining your options to get these free essentials. Aeroflow offers all major breast pump brands, including Medela, Spectra, Motif, Lansano, Amida, LV, Willow, and more. All you have to do is go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and fill out their free and easy qualify through insurance form. Extra bonus, if you use the coupon code birthhour15 in their online shop, you'll get 15% off all supplies and accessories. Head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour to get started. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Megan all about her experience using Aeroflow Breast Pumps to get her breast pump for free through insurance. Before we get to today's birth story, I want to talk a little bit about our online childbirth course. It's called Know Your Options, and this is the course you've been looking for if you just have that gut feeling that you know you should be taking a childbirth course, but maybe the one that's being offered to you by your care provider is not exactly what you're looking for. It might be more catered towards the type of birth they want you to have versus making you informed of all your different options and how to address different things that happen in birth, because as this podcast has shown us, birth is very unpredictable. So we would love to have you check out our 12 module course. You can go to the birthhour.com slash course to see detailed outlines of what is included in the course. You will also get a bonus course called beyond the first latch. That is an additional six modules all about pumping, feeding your baby, going back to paid work. If that's part of your plan and we have a special coupon code for you. It's 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. Again, that's the birthhour.com slash course. All right, today's episode is a rebroadcast. We're going to have a batch of replays this summer as we take a little bit of a summer break to spend time with our kids. And if you haven't listened to the podcast very long, they'll probably be new to you anyways because the podcast dates back to 2015. So we're pulling some episodes from our archives and you can always access all of those archived episodes via our Patreon page. So the most recent 100 episodes are always free in your main podcast feed. But then if you want to access over 600 additional birth stories, you can head over to patreon.com slash birth hour and access those for as little as $1 a month. Today's guest is Leah, who's going to talk about her two hospital births and how she worked with the medicalized system even though she had wanted a birth center birth originally. Hi, Leah. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family? Uh, my name is Leah, and I'm married to my husband, John. We've been together since uh, junior year of high school, so quite a while. <laughs> oh, high school sweethearts. <laughs> yeah. We have two sons, Jack, who is three and Bronson, who is going to be having his first birthday at the end of February. Super. So let's start off by talking about your first pregnancy and kind of the birth you were planning for there. We were not trying, but we weren't preventing either. And I had kind of decided, well, an October baby sounds really nice. So I'll, I'll try for an October baby. And, uh, that didn't happen. <laughs> and I was kind of relieved when I got my period. I was like, okay, maybe I'm not ready yet. So, and then just a couple weeks later, I got pregnant. So <laughs> I ended up uh, with a November baby, which um, is funny because my husband's born in November and there actually, I was, my due date, it was on his birthday. My periods were pretty predictable. Like I always tracked my cycle and I remember thinking, oh, my period should have come today. It was the end of February and I was going out with friends that night. So I didn't think anything of it and I was gone all night. And, um, you know, I, I woke up the next morning and I was like, oh, my period's still not here. So I just kind of laid on the couch and hung around and I was like, I should probably buy a test. So I went to the Dollar Tree 
because I had rationalized like, okay, I don't want to spend like $20 on a test if it's just going to tell me it's negative. So I'm just going to go and get the cheapest test. And, um, it was of course like one really solid line and like one barely faint line. And I was like, okay, what does this mean? Like, of course, you know, you, you see like, Oh, it's two lines. You're pregnant. But like I was in denial. I didn't, you know, so then I, went to my husband plays music. So went to his show and it was right next to a Walmart. So I went and bought, I was like, okay, well now I'll invest in the, the, the more expensive tests. And so I went to Walmart, bought two tests and then did it again. And then I got that same result, like the dark line and then a really faint other line. And I was like, okay. So, and my, I told my husband, I was like, so I think we might be pregnant. And he's like, well, don't tell me because I don't want to get excited. And then that's not the case. So let's just wait it out. And, um, ironically it was the time where I was at working and we had to decide on our insurance. So I was like, okay, my deadline is Thursday cause I have to pick a plan. And if I'm pregnant, that's going to really dictate what kind of plan I'm going to pick. Cause I want to, you know, hospital care, maternity care, all that stuff. So then I ended up on that day, right before work, I went and bought another test and I bought the digital test. So I was like, okay, this has to tell me yes or no. Um, and then I went and peed on the stick in the bathroom and then you know, I don't know if you've ever done a digital test, but there's like a waiting period. So it's just the screens blank. And I was like, of course I picked the broken test and I'm like sitting there looking at it. Um, and as, as I was about to throw it away, uh, it, then I just started, it started blinking. Yes, yes, yes. So I took a picture and I sent it to my husband and I said, so we're going to be parents. <laughs> And he was super excited. Uh, as long as I've been with him, he's always wanted to be a dad and he always wanted to have kids really early. Um, so, I mean, we weren't that young, 25, 26. So it wasn't super young, but um, he was so excited. And I mean, the pregnancy kind of just went smoothly. I mean, besides being tired in the beginning, it was uneventful. Everything kind of went um you know, without any hiccups, I initially had planned a, I wanted a birth center birth. So I had learned about medicalized births um, while a student at UCLA. I took a class in, uh, it's called Life Cycles. It was an anthropology course. And so in that class, we had watched the business of being born. Uh, we read, read a lot of case studies, or you know, around the world and maternal care um, in the U.S. and then in um other countries think one of them was in like Peru and just all over the world. And that was like my first introduction to kind of the different models of care. Unfortunately though, the insurance wouldn't cover it. And I even went to the length of going to see my primary care physician and having her write me a referral to go see the midwife in this birth center. Cause um, we live in Southern California and I'm actually lucky enough where I have two birth centers right where I live. So I thought, well, they can't deny me if my primary care physician says that I can go there, you know, and, um, nope. It, they sent me a letter said, we have a, uh, a group of OBGYNs that are more than qualified to handle your maternity care. Like we cannot approve this. And, um, it, at that point, you know, we were going, into my second trimester. So I kind of just had to make a decision and like, okay, well, I, I can't afford it out of pocket right now. Um, you know, cause I didn't think to plan in that way. And, um, it, logistically it just, we just had to move in the direction of a hospital birth. Um, so that, that was kind of upsetting, but then, you know, what I, what I decided is like, okay, like I'm just going to have to go with the system and find out, find my way in the system. So how I'm going to make the system work for me. So I did like the hospital birth class and, um, you know, went to all those monthly appointments and it was just really impersonal. I mean, I saw the same person every time because with this group of, uh, doctors, you know, you see the nurse practitioner, um, until you hit your, third trimester. And that's when you actually start meeting with all the OBGYNs. So I had the same nurse practitioner and 
she was okay, you know, don't really have any affinity towards her. And then when we went to the, the third trimester and got with the group of doctors, there were seven on staff. And like the first thing I learned was, okay, how does it work? You know, and I learned it's like the on-call schedule. So you just never know who you're going to get. And it's on call. And um, I did ask for the on-call schedule. So at least I had a heads up on who was on which day. And I made it a point to meet every single one of them to see like who I liked better, who I didn't like, and at least recognize people's faces and know what I was dealing with, I guess. So anyways, um, I had gone into my 40 weeks and I went in to do my non-stress test. So one thing that I thought was really uh, special was that my grandmother, who I'm very close with, she came down to be at the birth. And, you know, when we were scheduling her ticket, I said, I don't know when I'm going to have this baby. It's my first baby, you know, but he's due on November 8th. So if you want, you know, to maybe book your ticket for that day, um, that would be good. And so I had stopped working the Wednesday before I was going to be 40 weeks. And one thing that was really special to me and to my birth was that my grandmother, she was going to be there. So she purchased the ticket to be there a couple days before my due date. So when we went for my 40 week appointment, she came with me and we did the non-stress test and an ultrasound to check that everything with the baby was okay. The doctor had checked me and had said that I was three centimeters dilated, 90% a face. So, I mean, I was on my way, um, but no contractions. I didn't really have a lot of Braxton Hicks. There wasn't any type of sign that I was going to go into labor. But one thing retrospectively that I did realize is that he had stripped my membranes without my permission. Because I remember being, when he checked me, it was really uncomfortable. And and then I remember when I he was taking off his glove, I distinctly remember looking at his glove and I was like, wow, that looks different. Like, why does this glove look like that? It was like immediately that I left the office that I was like cramping and I was like had some spotting. And I knew that sometimes when you get checked, like those were things that were normal. So I didn't think anything of it. Uh, We went and got ice cream and I still wasn't feeling like great, but I was coping just fine. And now again, thinking back on it, I'm like, well, those were my early signs of labor he probably just thought, well, she's almost there. So I'm just going to move this along, which, you know, I wish that we had had a discussion about so I could be aware and just know what to expect because it kind of just hit me. I didn't know what was happening, like, because I had never bled before. I'd never felt cramping before when I was checked. So that was kind of disappointing, but I just kind of made the best of it. Um, It happened like I said, that my baby's due date was on my husband's birthday. So after the appointment, uh, we went and I made him dinner and cupcakes for his birthday. And he, you know, decided to go out with his friends for a little bit. And I said, I'm going to just stay at home. I'm tired, like have fun. You know, I want you to enjoy your time. Um, he's like, well, just call me if anything happens, I'll come right home. You know, I'm, I'm just going to be, you know, down the street. So he wasn't going anywhere far. And, um, I remember just being by myself, like watching TV and then still feeling like crampy. And, um, I called my mom and I said, mom, you know, maybe I'm in labor. I don't know. How do I know? And she's like, well, you would know. I was like, mom, no, I wouldn't. I've never never had a baby. And she was like, well, you'll just, you'll know when things like start picking up. And so I'm just kind of, you know, taking kind of inventory of like how I'm feeling my body. And I'm just like sitting there. And I remember like at around midnight, I could not sit down. Like I started, I would jump up and I was like, okay, this is now definitely something's happening. So I called my husband and I said, you got to come home. Like I'm going into labor. Um, I need you to come home. And he said, okay, uh, I'm going to come home now. So just at midnight, I think that's when it started like becoming active labor. And I spent most of the time laboring. Uh, That's one thing that I kind of 
feel was lacking in our education class at the hospital. Like there was no teaching us like coping mechanisms, you know, it was all about what to expect when you're actually having the baby and the things that can happen in the hospital, but not how to deal with labor. So I just became like mentally in a, in a certain place and just focused on my tactic was I just need to get through these next however many minutes. And what I did was take a heating pad and I (laughs) had put it like on my uh, stomach and was like inverted on the bed. So I couldn't lay down. I didn't have a birth ball or anything. Those suggestions weren't given to me. And I kind of realized that I hadn't planned or educated myself as maybe as much as I should have. Um, You know, I didn't make a birth plan because I knew that anything can happen in birth and I didn't want to set expectations for myself um, and then be disappointed. So I was kind of leaving the floor open was really rare for me. Like I said, I'm just like more of a planner. So um, I just basically laid there for about four to five hours. Um, I tried laying down with my husband, you know, he was laying in bed and I said, just go to sleep and I'll just time these because I don't need both of us to be exhausted. And so I was looking at the clock and kind of just keeping track of contractions. Now I know that there's all kinds of apps and stuff, but I just was doing it old school (laughs) with a digital clock. And about 6 a.m., you know, we left to the hospital, which is about, you know, 15 minutes away. And of course, there's no traffic at that time. It was a Saturday morning. So, you know, the streets were empty and we left when my contractions were, you know, four minutes apart, a minute long. So I was waiting for that like magic number to say, okay, like we can go. And then when we got to the hospital, we had to go through the emergency entrance because the main entrance was closed at the time. And luckily I had checked in prior to being admitted. So I had, I could bypass a lot of the questioning and all that stuff. And the first thing of course that they did was they said, okay, well, we're going to see how far along you are and make a decision about what to do once we know how many centimeters you're dilated. Well, it turns out that I was, she's, (laughs) when she checked me, she's like, oh, well, you're an eight and a half and a nine. And I was like surprised because I didn't really think, oh my gosh, like, I would have gone that fast. And she said, so if you want the epidural, you have to get the epidural now. Like you you don't really have a time. And I said, well, I'll just sign the papers. And if I decide to do it, then I'll do it. And she said, okay. And so I signed the, the papers and then, you know, she checked me one more time. She's like, well, you're at a nine. So, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'm already at a nine. Like I'm already here. Um, I really didn't, I'm like really terrified of needles. So having that needle on my back just wasn't something that I wanted to experience. And I had always in the back of my mind wanted to have a natural childbirth. My mom had one, my mother-in-law had one. So any experiences I had with birth were more on the natural side. So I wanted to try it, but I also, like I said, didn't want to set myself up if, you know, I couldn't handle it or anything like that. So once I knew that it was nine centimeters, I was like, okay, we're just going to go this. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. Um, and I made that decision. And then from there on out, like I was very focused on just, um, coping with the, tra- uh, the contractions. And, um, of course I was laying in the bed with all the monitors on me. And, um, at that point I was just exhausted because I'd been up all night. I've been up all day and then up all night. And I would just take little cat naps between each contraction, you know, for two minutes. I was there probably, you know, an hour. And then it was just, you know, I was complete. So the nurse said, okay, you can start pushing. And, um, another thing that I feel like is not shared a lot is like, there's good pushing and then there's bad pushing. Like, um, and the nurse was kind of at first, she's like, okay, push, you know, and I was pushing, but then she started to coach me, which I thought was really helpful because like I said, you don't know that there's, there's a certain way to push that's going to actually 
yield better results. So when she started coaching me and then I started focusing my energy and like moving the baby down, I felt like I was actually accomplishing something. And you know, you get to the point where they're always telling you like, Oh, he's, his head's right there. His head's right there. And you're just like, this is taking so long. (laughs) If his head's right there, why isn't the baby out? Like, and so she, um, I pushed for an hour, which is not that long, but at the time it felt like forever. And, um, they decided to like break my water and they found meconium in the water. What were some of the, before we move on, what were some of the things she was helping you with like coaching wise? A lot about focusing your energy. So you're just not like pushing, like, I guess if you think about like Kegel exercises or something like that, like how you just kind of do them, but like actually thinking about, okay, you really have to focus on this part of your body. And, um, you know, she also helped like maneuver my legs to give me more leverage, um, and instructing like my mom and my, um, my husband to hold my legs, um, in a way that was going to be, I guess, more strategic for the baby to come out. Uh, I don't specifically remember because like I said, I hadn't slept and I was just out of it. But I, I just, I do remember there being a transition from when I first started pushing, like I was just kind of pushing the way and then kind of like bearing down and like focusing my energy so that it was, um, more purposeful. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, and she was great. Like the nurse was great. Um, I thought, you know, this lady is amazing. Like she's just so nice. And I didn't really have any, like a, that was one thing that I was kind of knowing like, okay, I don't know which doctor I'm getting. I don't know what, you know, the staff is going to be like, cause you always hear from other moms like, Oh, don't have your baby there because this is my experience or have your baby there. This is the, the people are great. So you just never know what you're going to get. So I was really thankful when the, the nurse that was on staff and who was assigned to me, like I really connected with, um, And the doctor, luckily, she was the one, my favorite out of all of them. She was just, um, you know, pretty passive and not really pushing her agenda on me. And um, which I felt like was really relieving, like she was just letting me birth and not having a say so. And maybe it was because everything was progressing in a timely manner. I don't know but I didn't have any issues with her. And she was just kind of like when he was crowning, that's when she kind of came in and decided, you know, to did her thing. (laughs) And like I said, like they found meconium in the water when he was, uh, when they had broke it and um, they had a respiratory therapist come in. And I remember the nurse telling me like, don't be alarmed if he doesn't cry. And that I like from all the exhaustion, I kind of like got, reawakened by that because I was like, what do you mean? He's not going to cry. That's my baby. He's supposed to cry. Like, what is that? You know, they weren't explaining to me like what meconium in the water really meant. I mean, I knew what it was, but what they were afraid of. So at that point, I think that's when it changed. My mentality changed too. like, I wanted to get him out, um, safely. So after pushing an hour, he was finally born at 1035 in the morning with a big loud cry. So as soon as like he cried, I was just so relieved. And the respiratory therapist ironically was someone I went to high school with. So that was a little bit awkward. Uh, (laughs) um, So we, you know, he, they put him on my chest right away and it was just like the most amazing, like euphoric empowered feeling like I'm like, it was pure happiness. Um, and for someone who hadn't slept, you know, for 24 hours, just, I felt so energized and I was just, I was on cloud nine. Like I was just so happy and, um, I didn't really have any tearing. I had like a small, I think it was like, they said first degree. I think that's the smallest. It was just like two little stitches and, um, they put them, like I said, on my chest right away and we started breastfeeding right away. And it was just, I had all my family 
um, was in the waiting room. My, my sister, um, my mom, my aunt, my grandma, my dad, my sister-in-law, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law. And I had a whole bunch of people from my work that were there. So it was just like, as soon as he was born, like we were surrounded like with all this love and I just never had seen anything more perfect in my life. Like he was beautiful. And I was so in shock that I had birthed this baby without any, anything. And just with my own like strength and just having that support with my husband being there and my mom, it was just a great, it was a great first experience I thought, because, um, you know, you never really know how, how strong you feel until you've birthed to your baby. Like it just, it puts everything else on, uh, on another level. And, um, I still draw on those experiences, um, when I'm having a hard time because it's like, I had this baby with nothing and I did it on my own. And like, there's nothing that I can't do for it. it was, it's just that I go to that place whenever I need strength. It's like, you know, remember what you did and use that as, as proof that you can do anything else you want. So as far as postpartum, you know, it was pretty standard. You know, I didn't really, <laughs> when I remember going in to the bathroom for the first time, they're like, do you need to go to the bathroom yet? Do they need you to go to the bathroom yet? I was like, no, no. And then after probably, you know, two hours after he was born, they're like, okay, we have, we're going to help you to go to the bathroom. And um, so they took me and I remember then all this blood. Another thing that I'm kind of queasy about. And all this blood comes out. And then they're like, as I'm hobbling over to the toilet and I was like, no one told me there was going to be this much blood. Why didn't anyone tell me about this? Cause I didn't know what to expect postpartum. You know, I, I remember as a little girl, like when my sister was born and I remember going to see her and I remember the, the bedding, there was blood. And I like distinctly, that was always uh, stamped into my mind, but I didn't really connect the two because I know my mom hemorrhaged. So I just assumed that was part of that, but not just right part of the regular birth experience. So, um, I just, uh, remember feeling like so overwhelmed by all the fluid coming out of me for the first 24 hours. Um, but otherwise, I mean, we, we did, um, breastfeeding. We saw, I saw the lactation consultant multiple times. Um, I was just there, the, the standard, you know, 48 hours. Um, uh, when I got home though, and my milk came in, I did have some engorgement issues, which I was not anticipating. The next day after I brought the baby home, I was so engorged that like, he couldn't latch. And I was like, something's wrong. Like, this is not right. Like the baby's not latching. Um, you know, and I would set everything up. So I had like my rocking chair and my nursing stool and a pillow. And, you know, I had this whole setup that, you know, and then I would be sitting there and couldn't get him to go on and it would look like he wanted to nurse, but he couldn't latch on. Um, so I called the hospital and made an appointment with the lactation consultant right away. And, we had caught it just in time because I had started getting some red splotchiness, which is, you know, a symptom of um, mastitis. So I was only like, on a strict pumping schedule for the next 48 hours. I had to pump every two hours and nurse. So I would nurse, pump, nurse, pump. So I was constantly on the clock and it was, it was intense, but, but after it kind of regulated um, it was pretty smooth sailing from there. And it was good because I started building up my stash pretty early. <laughs> That's always good. <laughs> yeah. I loved how you talked about, you know, feeling empowered from your birth. And I think that when you have that confidence, especially as a first time mom, it's so helpful in those early days when you're just maybe questioning everything <laughs> about parenting this new little human. So. <laughs> It yeah. really does carry over. So when you found out you were pregnant again, what did you kind of think about doing differently or how did you plan that? So this baby I had, you know, legitimately, like now I was tracking cycles and like actually targeting when I would be pregnant. Um, and he didn't 
present himself as easily as the first time. So I, I knew the date that I had, you know, conceived or tried to conceive and, and we were leaving to vacation at the end of the month. And that's when I was supposed to get my period. So the day before my period, I take a test and it's negative. And the day of my period, which hasn't come, it's still negative. And I'm like, okay, well, we're leaving and I need to kind of know, and I'm getting these negative tests. So obviously, you know, it, it didn't happen. So I was like, I'll, I'll take an, if my period doesn't come in the next, you know, five days, I'll take another test, but maybe I'm just stressed because I had started a new job and, you know, there was a lot of changes I'm chasing after, you know, an 18 month old. So, um, just decided, okay, the last day of the vacation, we'll take a test. Um, and then lo and behold, <laughs> on that last day, finally, I was, I got the two lines and I was so happy. And we were like so happy because, um, we got to, you know, have this little secret at the end of our vacation. Cause we had gone with our um, extended family to, uh, the East coast. So that was really nice to, to when we got home that we shared that with them. Um, and with this birth, uh, again, I had a different insurance and I knew, I already knew that with this insurance, cause it was the, the state insurance. Cause at this time, um, the affordable care act was now a thing. So we were on, we had qualified for the state health insurance and I knew that, um, a birth center birth was going to be unlikely, um, just because of our financial situation and, um, just the limitations of a, the state health insurance plan, which I think, um, I think is a lot different for moms. If you're not, you know, on a plan you paid yourself or that you're, you're used to, like this was a whole different setup than what I was accustomed to. And just like having to prove I was pregnant. So that was just a whole ordeal. Like the, the, my complete experience with this baby was I wasn't, I was navigating so much bureaucracy And it was, it was really difficult because, um, you know, you had to submit a letter saying that you were pregnant. So I went and like, I got my blood test done and they had, they had proved that my, is it HCG? Is that the hormone? Yeah. Um, Yeah. So that those were elevated, but they couldn't exclusively put that I was pregnant they could just say that those levels were raised. So I had to go to a pregnancy center and they had to do an ultrasound and a test. And then they wrote up like an official letter saying I was pregnant with an estimated due date that I had to submit to the state department. It was just crazy. And, um, you know, with all the availability of OBGYNs in this area, they only had one that I could see. I went to him and he was only available on like Mondays and he was always late for the appointments because I try to get in before work and he'd always be stuck in a birth or C-section or, and it was just, it was getting really frustrating because I'm like, I'm just trying to do what I need to do to have this baby safely. And I already know that it's not going to be what I want it to be. So my first birth really prepared me for what I wanted in my second birth. And I knew I wanted an unmedicated birth. I knew that if I had to birth in a hospital, I was going to birth at the same hospital because I'm not going to right. I want to deal with the beast that I already know. I'm not going (laughs) to go and try to do something different. Um, when I had a positive experience the first time. So it was a lot of work, um, just to finally get into a place that, um, I could settle. Luckily, I found out that my primary care physician was able to refer me out to another doctor that birthed at um, that hospital. And he actually happens to be the head of that department in the hospital. Anyways, so it was a lot of challenges just stress-wise of the logistics of how I was going to get care and um, didn't have much choice, like I said, for a doctor. So um, once I was settled into a practice, I really decided that I wanted to educate myself more on birth and, um, just the different, uh, ways that you can birth and techniques to help you get through, um, you know, get through the labor. 
And so that's when I actually started listening to this podcast. I I found it on Instagram one day and I was like, well, okay, I'm going to check it out and see if it's going to be the, you know, good fit for me. Cause it was something that I could listen to on the way to work. You know, I love just audiobooks and in, in general. So I thought that this was going to be a great way to get the education I needed, um, when, when I could get it. And then I listened to my first birth story and I was hooked and I was like, okay, this is exactly what I need. I need to know other people's experiences. I need to know, um, what's out there and what they did great and what they learned from. So I can apply that in my own birth. And I remember, uh, I would, and my doctor probably was really annoyed with me because I would go in and I would ask, what do you guys practice, um, gentle C-sections, gentle cesareans? And she gave me a deer in the headlights look. She didn't know what I was talking about. I was like, well, when you do a C-section, do you put these things in place? Because I knew, you know, that was a possibility and I wanted to be prepared for their policies and procedures. Um, and that's what I made my, um, expectations really clear. And, I don't think that she was used to that because I felt like her answers were always very noncommittal and political. Like, well, um, you know, we want you to have a safe birth and bring the baby safely into the world kind of thing, you know, not telling me one way or another. So that didn't really give me a lot of confidence. So I knew, okay, I had to be an advocate for myself because this lady wasn't going to advocate for me. And so what I did, um, I couldn't afford a doula. So I educated my husband a lot and I let him know like my wants and needs. And I said, I don't want to be put on Pitocin. I don't want to be induced. I don't want this. I don't want that. Like I was very specific with him, like here in, in case I'm not in a position to make, um, decisions. These are the decisions that you have to make on our behalf. Um, and so that really gave us a lot of confidence because at least I knew that there was somebody else on my side that could, um, advocate for what I wanted if I wasn't in a position to do so. So fast forward, I guess, again, I was, um, you know, approaching my due date and, um, I was about 38 weeks pregnant, uh, you know, just about. And I go in to see my regular appointment and, uh, she offers to induce me and I say, no, I'm just 38 weeks pregnant. I don't want to be induced. She's like, okay, well just so you know, I'm okay with that if you want to do it. And I said, okay, well I'll keep it in mind. Um, but right now I'm, I'm okay. And then again at 39 weeks, she said, are you sure you want to be induced? We can induce you, you know, and you can have this baby. And I said, no, I don't want to be induced. <laughs> I've had this conversation before. Like I, I can have, I've had one natural childbirth. I've done it all on my own without anything. And I really don't want to do that, you know, and she had offered to strip my membranes. And I said, no, like I'm not past my due date. I, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't even want to be checked. Um, so that was different because the first time I had wanted to know the whole time where I was. And this time I was like, I really, you know, it really doesn't matter. So I'm just going to spare myself, um, you know, even the, the, the possibility of someone stripping my membranes or sending me into labor. Like I want my son to come when he's ready. So again, at the 40 week appointment, she asked for the third time <laughs> if I wanted to be induced. And, um, we did the non-stress test and everything. And, uh, I said, no, uh, I don't. <laughs> um, I wasn't even technically 40 weeks. I was like 39 and five days or something like that. So I was kind of a smart ass. And at that point, cause I was getting frustrated. I said, is it like I'm getting my hair done? Are you guys not going to be in the hospital if I decide that I want to be induced? Like you guys are there. So why do I need to make an appointment? Like if we change my mind, I will, make sure to tell you, but I do not want to be induced. Um, and there was no reason for it other than for scheduling. You know, um, I had a pretty standard pregnancy. I didn't have any, you know, real issues. There was a little bit of a scare with the, you know, gestational diabetes. But once I did the three hour test, all the stuff came back normal. 
Um, so, and I was measuring, you know, on point. So there was no, um, evidence that that was necessary. And if there was, of course, then I would consider it, but there wasn't. And it was just, I felt because they wanted to make it more convenient for them. Um, so I went to bed on my due date, uh, in a huff, (laughs) frustrated that I was still pregnant. Um, and the next morning I woke up and, um, you know, decided, okay, well, my son, I'm, I'm not working at this point. Um, you know, I'd taken my maternity leave and said, I'm going to take the, my son on a walk and we're just going to enjoy our day. I'm not going to worry about it. And fun fact, obviously (laughs) both my kids were born 40 weeks in one day. Um, and so as soon as I started on that walk at nine 30 in the morning, my contractions, uh, started and I remember we were walking and I'd stop kind of breathe through them. And my son would point out, you know, Oh, mommy, a tree or whatever was, you know, in somebody's yard or, um, along the sidewalk. And it was actually a really lovely, um, morning and just, the whole experience was actually really nice because I was just taking it really slow and such a different experience because it was during the day. So, um, you know, we, we did that and I, for whatever reason, got it into my mind, like, okay, well now that I'm in labor, I should go get your haircut. Why? I don't know. I thought it was important for my son to go get his haircut. Um, so that, you know, when we go and do our newborn photos with the baby, that his hair would be nice. Um, somebody else could have done it, but I had it in my mind that that was a good idea. So I packed us up in the car and, uh, you know, went and (laughs) took him to go get his haircut and I'm sitting there going in labor and just like breathing through the contractions as the lady's cutting his hair. And she's like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm just, I'm just in labor right now. It's fine. She's like, um, are you sure? Like you probably should go to the hospital. I said, no. I said, well, I'm not anywhere near the time that I should be going to the hospital, but, um, thank you. And don't, we're just, I'm just want to, I just want to live my life and go about my day as normal and just kind of enjoy this time. Um, so on the way home, um, he fell asleep on, you know, on the, on the car ride home. And so I laid him on the couch and I, I laid there going and having contractions. And I, it was kind of just so beautiful to just to have this moment, like here's the last day I'm going to have my baby, like my only baby. And so we got to really, um, (laughs) it's a little bit emotional. (laughs) Um, so we got to, he was laying down and sleeping and I was just laying down next to him and, you know, I would breathe through the contraction, but, and this kid never naps, you know, (laughs) he never naps. So just the fact that we had this like really solitary, calm moment together. And, um, you know, during this time, obviously I had called like my husband and I called my mom and my dad and I just said, okay, I'm, I'm in labor. Just want to let you guys give you a heads up, you know, and I had called my mother-in-law cause we had agreed that she would come and pick up my son when um, we were ready to go to the hospital. Uh, my husband at the time was, uh, he does service work. He's a service technician. So he drives all over and he was already at a place that of course was like an hour and a half away. And he's like, well, you got to tell me if you want me to come home because the next place is like on the other side of LA. So, you know, and I'm going to be stuck in traffic coming home. So if you think that this is really it, you know, on when I'm done with this job, let me know. So when he called back and said, okay, I'm done in Oxnard and they want to send me to El Monte. What do you want me to do? I said, well, just come home. Just don't, don't go to El Monte. Just come home. We're going to have this baby today and you need to be here. I remember he came in and the place that he worked at, cause he works with, you know, repairing Coke machines, installing the Coke machines, the freestyles and everything like that. So he usually works at restaurants and they give him food as a thank you a lot of times. So he comes walking in with a pizza and he's like, look, I brought you this pizza. Um, I know that you need, you know, to fuel your body because you're going to be doing a lot of work right now. And I said, I can't even eat at that. I can't look at that. 
it's disgusting. Like, and I love pizza, but it was just, I took one bite and I was like, nope, I can't. Like, I just, it, it's not going to happen. And he's like, okay, okay. Um, so he starts getting everything ready. Um, I call my mother-in-law and she comes over and she gets my son and his bag's already packed and she picks him up and she's like, you really should go to the hospital now. I was like, um, at like seven minutes apart. I'm okay. Like, I'm just kind of wanting to wait it out because in my mind I said, this was my thinking was like, well, the longer I'm at home, like the less likely it is that they're going to be able to do any interventions, you know, the more comfortable I'm going to be. So I'm just going to try to wait it out as long as I can. So she's like, okay, well, I'm going to take him now and you should go soon. And I was like, okay. My husband's like, well, do you have, do I have time to take a shower really quick? You know, um, I, you know, I've been working all day. I want to clean up. And I said, yeah, we're, we're at seven minutes apart. You're fine. You know, I'm not planning to leave until we're like three, four minutes apart. And he's like, okay. Um, and I, as soon as my son walked out the door and as soon as that freaking water turned on, the contractions just changed to two minutes apart. At first I was like, okay, like this is just one on top of the other, but it was, like after it happened quite a few times, I was like, oh my gosh, like this now has definitely transitioned. This baby is coming fast. I just called out to him. I said, nope, you don't have time to take a shower. Turn it off. We got to go. We got to go right now. Um, <laughs> these contractions are just, it was as if like my body knew, okay, now that I've taken care of my son, now that I've taken care of the baby, we can really focus on this. Cause that was definitely keeping, slowing things down. Cause my energy was more like on taking care of my baby. My grandma was coming down again for this. Then my aunt was coming down again for this birth, and they had they had arrived that day. So you know, I had an entourage waiting for this baby to come again. You know, my husband installed the car seat in the car, and then we just left. You know, just piled everything in the car and got moving. And of course, at this time, it's three thirty in the afternoon, and probably the worst time to be driving on the streets because this is when works just starts getting out for people. This is when schools get out and this, it was just so much traffic. And my husband's like, should I take the streets or the freeway streets or the freeway? And I was like, um, I don't know. Just take the streets, whatever. It's fine. Just take the streets. I remember distinctly looking at the, the time and it was three thirty eight, And I was just like, I just have to survive like these two minutes. I just have to survive these two minutes. And then, the next, you know, we just need to get past this time. And I broke, for whatever reason, breaking up my time into two-minute increments was helping me cope immensely. And right as we're, you know, a couple of main streets, I guess, uh, before the hospital, we're like on a main um, street turning left, my water breaks. And I said, oh, I was like, my water's breaking. My water's breaking. And he's like, what do you want me to do? Pull over? I was like, no, just drive. And I don't know what, I was like really concerned about his speed. And I said, just, he's like, I'm going as fast as I can. And I said, you do not go over the speed limit. I was like, I do not want to be pulled over. <laughs> I don't know why. I was like, was really worried about the speed. And I said, just, I was like, I just want to get there safe. And, um, and then I started pushing, I, I like my body was just pushing this baby out in the car as my water is breaking and like in the front seat. And now I'm starting to get stressed and like anxiety, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have this baby in the car. I'm going to have the baby in the car. Like, um, luckily, you know, we were about two minutes from the hospital. So at that point, like we, we arrived and the hospital was um, all, it's been remodeled, but every time that we've been there for appointments and everything, it's been clear, you know, to go through the main entrance. But of course, this time that we need to go to the main entrance, it's all blocked off. So we have to go around to the emergency again. And it says valet, but there's no one there to valet your car. And my husband just has his, um, you know, he runs me in and the car is running, you know, keys and everything in the ignition. And then I go through the emergency and I'm just like, uh, I'm in labor. I need to go up to the maternity ward now. And they're like, no, just take a seat. We'll get you uh, a, a chair right now. I said, no, you don't understand. I was like, 
my water broke. I'm pushing this baby out. You need to get me there right now. And for whatever reason, finally, like it clicked, like we don't have time. Like I'm not a one centimeter, you know, in labor, like I'm a 10 um, centimeters. And, um, so we had, you know, they wheeled me up there and they put me in the elevator. Ironically enough, the doctor that had delivered my first son was actually in the elevator with us. Um, and I was like, Oh, hi, I'm having a baby again. Um, but she wasn't delivering me this time, um, because we were with a different group. Um, so, you know, the guy runs me to the, um, you know, the maternity ward the room and you know the nurse is like okay well you know we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and check you out um and see where you are and meanwhile I had told my husband don't go with me go park the car you can't leave the car running with the keys in it you know so he's gone and I'm just by myself with this nurse and um she's like okay I'm just gonna check you and um you know see where you're at and uh, I had recognized, you know, what that meant. And then I was like, okay, fine. You, you can check me. I know exactly where I'm at. <laughs> um, and then she like just did one glance and she's like, oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, you're complete. So if you can't wait for the doctor, we can just, uh, if you can just hold it in, that would be great. But if not, like, we'll just push this baby out. It's going to be fine either way. And I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, and so, so they're like sh- stripping me down and, making, you know, wheeling me onto the bed and, you know, just chaos. It's just pure chaos. Um, I felt like, uh, my adrenaline was just like through the roof and, you know, my husband's still not there and I'm, you know, he's texting, you know, everybody like she's having the baby, she's having the baby. And like, I have a, I have a group chat with my friends and, you know, he's like trying to talk to them. Like Leah's having her baby, like, you know, you gotta, you gotta, if you want to come and get over here, you got to get over here. And, you know, people didn't really realize like what that meant. Um, they thought, Oh, they have time, you know, because usually you do have time. Um, just not this time. (laughs) Um, so we had, um, you know, got, he got miraculously found his way to the room. You know, later I found out that they were saying that I wasn't there, that they, he, they didn't know who I was or what he was talking about. And he's like, she's, she just came up here and they're like, no, we don't have her in our system. We don't know what, you know, she's not here. I'm sorry. And then the, the guy who had actually wheeled me up there had spotted him and showed him where I was. So he just had, he just got there and like grabbed my hand and, um, and then, um, the lady, one of the nurses, she, uh, she's like, okay, well I have to put a, a, you know, an IV in you. I said, do you really have to do that? You don't really have to do that. She's like, yes, we do just in case you hemorrhage. And I was like, Ugh, fine. Like I knew that that would probably be something I couldn't fight. So I was like, and she like jabbed the needle into my hand. And I just remember screaming at her. I was like, ouch, like, and being kind of short with her. She's like, oh, sorry, I didn't think you would notice uh, because you're in labor. I'm like, yes, I noticed. And that hurt. (laughs) I was like, that hurt more than this contraction. And um, my husband's like, what are you putting in her in her right now? And she's like, it's just sailing. He's like, "Okay, no Pitocin. (laughs) Because he was like trying to go back from, you know, what we had discussed. And um, He's like, okay, if it's saline, I'm okay with that or, you know, whatever liquid it is. And, um, so, you know, I'm just on the bed and the doctor like runs in out of breath and, you know, strapping on his gloves and, you know, he's like, just goes down to, you know, the foot of the bed and he says, okay, push. Okay. Push again. All right. Go ahead and go down and grab your baby. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, go and grab your baby. And I was like, okay. You know, and I was so like excited because I was able to pull him the rest of the way out and like straight onto my chest. And, um, it was just this beautiful moment. Like, oh my gosh, like not only did I get to birth this baby 
and what a gift that is. But now I even got to kind of catch him in a way. And like, I totally wasn't expecting that. So I got, I didn't get like a birth center, but I did get like a wink and a nod where I could like be a little bit more participatory in my birth, which I had really wanted. You know, of course, once he was out and the placenta was out, my body was like shaking and I was just so like so much adrenaline through my body and they had to come in and like bring like a heated blanket. Um, and the nurse like turns to me and she's like, so do you know how long you were here before you had the baby? And I was like, no idea, you know? And she's like, you were here 12 minutes. You got from the moment you walked into the hospital to when you had this baby was 12 minutes. You (laughs) barely made it on time. Wow. And I was like, Oh my gosh. I don't know how, how I was able to maintain that, but I was just so thankful because, you know, I was able to do it in the room instead of in the car, which was a lot scarier to me. I'm not, I'm not proficient in birthing. I I can birth the baby, but I'm not so proficient on, you know, maneuvering them out of there. So, um, I was just relieved that I had made it. And then of course, like I had, and my husband looked at my phone and there was like 136 text messages of just like people trying to get a hold of me. And um, he's just like telling them all like, oh, he's here. He's here. And like I had friends the morning before or that morning, like, oh, are you still pregnant? I'm like, yes. And then, you know, just a few hours later saying, oh, well, now we have our second baby boy. And so it was just it was an adventure and something obviously I'll never forget. Um, but it was just what I had to do in a lot of ways to protect myself and feel like I was advocating for myself, even though I was like in this, like a very stringent structure. And, you know, it's unfortunate that we don't all have access to all of those resources, um, like a doula and, you know, being able to really choose your, provider. I mean, there is some, some selection and, but it's always important, like know your choices, even someone like myself that was very limited. I still knew what my choices were and I was able to make decisions for myself based on, you know, the education that I had and the experience that I had and, you know, working really hard to like listen to birth stories and know the right questions to ask or even, having the foresight to be like, okay, this happened to this. Let me ask about that. Like I wouldn't even, it hasn't maybe something completely left filled, but at least I had some limited knowledge about that in the back of my mind. So I mean, my biggest, my biggest advice for people, whenever they ask me about birth and, you know, I'm saying birth the way that you want, it has nothing, you know, birthing a baby and being um, a participant is and not an observer. So that's my biggest piece of advice. I was like, always participate in your birth. Do not let your birth happen to you, but be a part of it and be present with it. Because, and now whenever I talk to moms or whenever I talk to people who are thinking of having their second or want to know about, you know, how I had two natural births, like I, I give them that information. But I think just having, doing their research and encouraging them to look at other things and saying, no, just because you had a C-section doesn't mean you have to have another C-section. Like you have, mm-hmm. there are, a VBAC is possible. I've never had a C-section, but I know that that exists. And I want you to know that that exists and to seek out that kind of support because it's important. Um, and it's important to ask questions and don't let yourself be, be pushed around by the white coats because, you know, they, they have a different agenda than you. And that's important to realize is, you know, your, your sense of urgency, your sense of, you know, protection is always going to be different than the the person on the other side. And, um, so I always just tell people be, be, be proactive in your birth. Definitely. That's kind of my whole goal with the podcast. So (laughs) I love hearing that and that, um, listening to the podcast was helpful to you as well. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think the most important, um, resource for me was this podcast and just being able to connect with these people and, you know, really harnessing my, my previous birth, you know, that's really, like I said before, was such an empowering experience that it really carried me through to this experience that in a lot of ways was different. And I wasn't expecting to have to deal with those certain challenges and, um, but knowing, 
that, you know, I was basically had all these women who had come before me who was able to, you know, provided a big sense of support, even though that they don't know who I am, you know, and, and I hope to be that for other people when listening to my story is that, you know, I can be a sense of support for them. Very cool. Well, are there any resources that you haven't mentioned that you wanted to share? Obviously this podcast was amazing and, you know, a big part of, of my second birth experience. Um, I think, you know, Instagram is a great place to get education and, um, and just, there's so many great, um, handles that really highlight the positive things about birth and make it into such a beautiful thing. And, um, so I would definitely check that out because they, they present a lot of images so you can see, you know, a lot of, you know, what birth looks like and it's, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And did you want to share where people can connect with you online? The social media I use the most is um, Instagram. Um, you can find me on Facebook too under my name, Leah Rodriguez. And uh, my my Instagram handle is L Rodriguez. Perfect. Well, I'll put those on your show notes page as well. And thank you so much for coming on the show today to share your birth stories with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm like so excited. You don't even know. I told everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I get to share my birth story. I'm so happy. Yes. So um, thank you for having me. Thanks again to Leah for sharing her birth stories with us. You can head over to thebirthhour.com and find her show notes page for more information. Now I'm going to chat with Megan about Aeroflow Breast Pumps, today's sponsor, and to get your free pump through insurance as well as other things like maternity compression garments and lactation education and support, head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and fill out their free and easy qualify through insurance form. All right, let's hear from Megan. Hi, Megan. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Aeroflow. I'm so excited to talk to you. Hi, Bryn. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you before we get into our chat about Aeroflow breast pumps? Of course, I have three kids. My oldest is four. She was born in 2017. And then we, um, my middle is two. And then my youngest is brand new. She, he is six weeks old. All right. So tell us about how you discovered Aeroflow breast pumps and uh, why you decided to use them to get your breast pump. Well, so I discovered Aeroflow through your podcast, of course, okay. <laughs> so, which I listened to religiously. <laughs> um, I didn't discover, fortunately, I didn't discover your podcast until I was pregnant with my second. Um, okay. And so I started using it with um, with my second and then also with my third. Um, and with my first, <laughs> I of course, didn't know about Aeroflow. And so I just got the prescription from the doctor and was sent to a medical supply store, had a wait in line, was just given this like brown box. <laughs> I didn't have any choice about which breast pump I was going to get. Um, so I didn't really know any better. So when I found out about Aeroflow, um, I was like, well, it's, it's almost seemed too good to be true. <laughs> and uh, <No. laughs> And, uh, it was awesome. So it is, it was exactly what you said it was going to be. It was pretty incredible. That's really cool. I haven't talked to anybody who has done it without Aeroflow and with, so I'm excited to, uh, hear how that was different for you. So, um, for those that don't know, can you just kind of explain the process for getting your breast pump, uh, for free through Aeroflow breast pumps? Sure. So I logged into the website. I typed in some of my information. I think I needed my, um, my insurance information, um, due date, things like that. And then just press submit. And I think honestly, within maybe a day, maybe two days, I heard back, via email and they had, they contacted my insurance company and everything. I didn't need to actually even give them a prescription. I think they contacted my midwife. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they, they, first they said it was just kind of in process. And then maybe a day or two later, um, I got to access my personal page. They had choices of probably a dozen different breast pumps that I had to choose from. Some were free, some were for an upcharge. So it was really cool. And then I could take the time and kind of research which ones I wanted and which ones would best suit what I needed. So it was really incredible versus my first time, which I was just literally just handed a brown box. <laughs> like, this is what you get. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that was really incredible. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love that they contact your care provider for you and your insurance and everything because just the last thing you want to be doing is making another call or figuring out how to fax something to somebody or whatever. So that part was really nice for me and especially that they work with um, midwives as well as, you know, a a doctor's office or something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I know. And I'm not um, savvy with insurance. So is any anybody, yeah. <laughs> they make my, it really hard, not, not my jam. And so I don't even know, honestly know how they, they did it, but they did it, it yeah. again. Like, it, um, there are very few things that I try to give advice about to people who are pregnant, like pregnant ladies. <laughs> we already have too much advice that it's unsolicited advice coming in from people. Yeah. But the two things are always aeroflow and the birth hour. <laughs> Aww, I love know. it. Because I don't think some, a lot of the people I've actually told about Aeroflow have never even heard of it. I'm like, this, you guys have to check this out. It sounds too good to be true. But really, this is what you should do. Yeah. So. Well, I love that. Thanks for spreading the word. <laughs> yeah. Um, what pump did you end up going with for your second? And then did you get a new one for your third? I did. So this is kind of funny. So um, I... I was between the Spectra. I used the Medela with the, my first time around. And then, um, overwhelmingly advice I got was to get the Spectra, but I ended up with a Luna motif based on uh, your podcast. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so I, I ended up with the Luna motif and I was really happy with that. And then the third time around, um, I actually did the super upcharge and got the hands-free one. Um, I think I went with the Willow, Okay. Um, so I'm still figuring that one out, <laughs> but I'm only, <laughs> I'm six weeks postpartum. So there's a bit of a learning curve with it. And so, um, I'll go back to work in, you know, a few months. So I'll hopefully figure it out by then. Awesome. That's so funny. I think I have done the exact same path as you. I started with a Medela and again, it was just handed to me in a brown box. And then uh-huh. I got um, a Spectra with my second, I guess, and then um, the Luna from Motif with my third when that came out. So oh, how um, funny. Yeah. <laughs> and the Luna was definitely my favorite by far. So yeah, it was incredible. I know. And it was just funny because like I said, a lot because I think the Luna wasn't as well known maybe as the Spectra and the Medela. Right. And so, you know, maybe I think I took it to my Facebook page, like anyone have any recommendations and like overwhelming light was the Spectra. And I was like, mm, I'm going to go with the Luna motif. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, on all of the podcasts I listened to, I was like, I'm going to go with Britain's opinion on this one. And I, I was happy with it. So awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experience. I really appreciate your time today. All right. All right. Bryn, take care. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.